All right, you ready? I want to talk about failures today. Oh, Richard, that's not happy talk. We only talk about the positive. Where's the sunshine and the rainbows? You know, life at this level is an interesting possibility. Because life at this level is both success and failure. It is light and shadows, day and night. And if we just focus on the light, we grow unconscious to the darkness. So today, I want us, as we do our last gratitude series, I want us to focus on our failures and celebrate our failures and give thanks for our failures and and bring our failures into the light so that we no longer need to live in the shame of our failures. So our affirmation this morning is, thank you, God, for all my failures. Together, thank you, God, for all my failures. One more time like we actually mean it. Thank you, God, for all my failures. Now, (laughs) the more you fail and the bigger your failures are, the more this talk is going to be meaningful. Like if if you're practically perfect like Mary Poppins in every way, this talk is not going to be very meaningful for you because you've lived your life always above the line. Right? But those of us, who have failed and failed big, right? We know how how much of a struggle it is to actually give thanks for our failures. If you had to make a list of all your failures, would it be a long list? Or would it be a short list, right? And are the items on that list, are, are there any items on the list that you've just hated? that you failed that. And what I want us to see today is can we learn to be grateful for all of our failures? In the family you grew up in, how did they handle failure? Was it tolerated? Was it despised? Was it celebrated? Or was it expected? When you, were, when you failed as a child, did you feel shame? Or did you feel love and acceptance? Were you expected to be perfect and not make any mistakes? Did you you have siblings who were better at worse at making mistakes than you? Were you the troublemaker in the family? Or was there somebody even worse than you? See, I want to look at all this stuff because I believe that we, many of us, most of us, still have a degree of shame when it comes to our failures. And part of our spiritual work is opening the space to let light even in the places where we feel like we have failed. Because my point, and I'm going to give you my point, this is my entire point today, your ego cares if you fail. Is that true? Yes. Does your spirit care when you fail? No. And and that's one of the great, almost impossible things to hold is that our ego is so invested in how successful we are. And yet our spirit knows that we are so much more than the the wins and the losses, that we are so much more than the details that we sometimes carry around. And so what if today you actually could hold the wins and the losses in your life in a very different way. Thank God for all my failures. Together, thank God for all my failures. One more time like we mean it. Come on. Thank God for all my failures. Do do, do you all have at least one failure that still kind of gets you? Like you're still a little embarrassed about, you don't like to talk about, you hope people don't find out about. Because I think that most of us have something in our life that we would prefer had never happened. And yet it has, it did. So what is your big, fat, juicy failure? Was it a marriage that crashed and burned? Was it a business that failed badly? Was it a bankruptcy? Do you have a child or several children that are a piece of work? 
Have you, have you not lived your true potential? Have you dealt with addiction? So if you had to make a list of your failures, could you be willing to write them all down so that you could see them? Thank you, God, that I am more than my failures. I am more than my past. Together, thank you, God, that I am more than my failures. I am more than my past. Matthew 5, 48 says this. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, how do you understand that? How many of you have arrived at that level of perfection where everything you do, everything you say, every way you act is perfect? Anybody reach that level? There's one person in the back. God bless you. Congratulations, right? Right? For most of us, we have not attained that level. Because what is perfect about us is never going to be our humanity. Our humanity is not supposed to be perfect. The whole, the whole reason we have a humanity is so we can experience imperfection. That every situation that we've created is, is you know, the, the ancient Grecians, in ancient Greece, they would make sure anything that they made, anything that was out of the hand of man, had to have an imperfection. So whether it was a building, whether it was a work of art, whether it was a statue, whatever it was, they made sure that there was always something imperfect because they believed that only God was supposed to be perfect. Now, I've never had to work that hard to make sure everything in my life had an imperfection in it. For me, it just came naturally, right? And, and I want you to hear, enjoy it with me as we say together, I make mistakes. Together, I make mistakes. Say it one more time with just joy in your face. I make mistakes. But I want you to see that I'm not asking you to say, I am a mistake. They're radically different. Because the God in you, the I am in you, is not a mistake. But your personality is all over the place. Like we're up, we're down, sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. We're all over the place. But when we identify with our mistakes, we're actually identifying with the part of us that's always going to be in that process of transformation. But your spirit is always whole. Your spirit is of God. Now, if you look at the world around us, right? God created this world around us. Would we say the world around us is perfect? Like, do we, does any of us blame God for an imperfect world? This is not, I mean, if you look at the world, I could come up with a better plan. At least that's what I think. That's what my ego tells me, right? Is that I could come, and yet, the idea, if God is perfect, then God is not attached to the three-dimensional experience. Because what is perfect about God is spirit. Like, we're not here to be perfect. We are here to express God. And in this conversation about our failures, I want, I want to bring love into the conversation. Because love really is the point. How many of you think you could love a perfect person? Like, I think it'd be relatively easy to love a perfect person because they're perfect, right? You never have to be disappointed or frustrated. You never have to be cross with them, right? You, they never push your buttons because they're perfect, right? And I think it'd be so much easier to love a perfect person. The challenge is, I haven't met that person yet, right? Right? that we're actually getting an opportunity to practice loving ourselves and everyone around us, even though we're not perfect. It's that we have these perfect imperfections, and our failures give us an opportunity to practice a more mature love. See, if I can only love you when you're perfect, I'm not very good at love. And some of us have wanted the people around us to be perfect because we have felt like we needed them to be perfect because our love wasn't big enough to handle their imperfections. 
But true love, real love, God love, embraces all of who we are, allows us to be all of who we are, and and our imperfections actually teach us unconditional love. How many of you can think of an aspect of yourself that sometimes you struggle with loving? Right? Anybody got at least one, right? And what I want you to see is that, that our failures, our imperfections, actually are necessary for us to embrace a bigger definition, a bigger, a greater experience of love, that, that we have to let go of the need to be perfect so that we can embrace a bigger definition of love and what truly love means in our life. And, and I'm gonna make the case today that even Jesus had moments. It's like, no. Oh. Mark 11, the next day as they were leaving Bethlehem, Jesus was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to it to find if there was any fruit. And when he reached it, he found there was nothing but leaves. And because it was not in season for figs, and he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard them say that. On reaching Jerusalem, he entered into the temple. So was Jesus' blood sugar a little low apparently that day? Right? Were there any McDonald's between where he was camping out in Jerusalem? No. So he was hoping to get a bite of fig before he went in and spent the whole day in Jerusalem doing all of his Messiah stuff, right? So on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple, the temple court, and began to drive out those buying and selling there. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and and the benches where they were selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise in or around the temple court. And he taught them that he said, it is, a not ri- is it not written that my house will be called the house of prayer for all nations and you've made it a den of thieves, right? Right, so can we give Jesus permission to have a moment? Could, apparently he had a, a good part of that whole day, right? Like he started out bad and it, and it didn't go well, right? In the morning... And evening came, and Jesus' and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree, and it had withered to its root. <laughs> now, imagine the disciples' eyes as they're walking back into Jerusalem, and just yesterday, it was a healthy, green, leafy fig tree, and they watched their teacher curse it. And now the next day, they're walking back to Jerusalem, And that same fig tree is dead to the root. How many of us would go in big time shame? Like how many, like here I am trying to be the Messiah. It's it's my big time. We're in Jerusalem. And I can't even get into Jerusalem without killing something. Right? Most of us would go into shame about this. But what did Jesus say? He said, have faith in God. For truly I say, if any one of you, Say to this mountain, go from here to there and throw it in the sea. It will be done if you do not have doubt in your heart, but believe what you're saying will happen. It will be done. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you will receive it and it will be yours. And when you stand in prayer, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. I want you to hear this. Instead of going into a shame, about a moment that he had, he used it as a teaching moment on the power of prayer. That over and over again, what I want to see is there is so much more space in our universe for us to make mistakes if we have enough love that actually surrounds us and enfolds us, even in the times where we leave love the most, even in the times where we feel the most empty and the most depleted, where we feel like the biggest loser. It's those moments where we need the most love. And when we mature in love, we actually provide a healing in every time where out of our emptiness we made a mistake. You know, many churches, we hear this idea that we are born sinners. And there's so much shame around that. Instead of, and, and the definition of sinner means to miss the mark. And, and what if we just allow ourselves to miss the mark, but we are so surrounded and enfolded in love that there's no shame attached to it? Like, 
we identify with our mistakes, I think sometimes more fully than we identify with our spiritual nature. And today, what if you could be soft-hearted with yourself and everyone around you? What if you could be the person in your life, in your world, that people could share their failings, they could share their mistakes, they could share their insecurities, and they know that in your presence, they would be profoundly loved. I believe that one person who truly has mastered unconditional love can heal thousands, thousands. Because in that experience, people feel completely safe to share their deepest wound. And in their deepest wound, when they get to be loved, it changes everything. And, 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 and this really starts with us. Like, is there a mistake? Is there a problem? Is there a challenge that you've judged yourself for and not get offered yourself unconditional love? And as we begin to expand the capacity of our heart to love, we are different. It's changed that we are going to fail. We're going to fall short. We're going to make mistakes. And the truth is, everyone in our life is going to fail, is going to fall short, is going to make mistakes. But love can be bigger than that. Today, I want us to spend a little time giving thanks for everything that makes us human. Everything that we've judged as an imperfection or a problem or just not right or broken. And I want to see if we can love ourselves and everyone around us in a way that sets us free. When we offer people unconditional, when we offer people conditional love, we are setting a bar that sometimes is too high to jump. But when we offer people unconditional love, It sets them free to be the very person they are because we see more than just their story or their drama. 1 John 4, we read, And so we know and rely on the love of God as for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we may have confidence on the day of judgment, because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love because God loved us first. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For everyone who does does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot possibly love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this commandment, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Today, I want to open a space, a big space. I want to open a space where we get to just love each other no matter what's gone on before. That it's not our need or our job or our problem to judge one another. Our job is to be an open-hearted place where the people in our life feel safe enough to reveal themselves, truly, deeply, profoundly reveal themselves knowing that they will receive our love because we have received the infinite love of God. And not only is that a gift that we offer others, but it's the greatest gift that we offer ourselves. That every time we can, we can offer ourselves unconditional love instead of judgment, we are perfected. We are made new. We experience all the love that God is. 
So today, can you think of one failure, one mistake, one judgment that you would be willing to, to surround and unfold in pure love for yourself and maybe somebody else? And to see if we can make a, a, a circle of love so big around each one of us that, that it literally changes our life. Thank you, God, for all my imperfections. Together, thank you, God, for all my imperfections. Thank you, God, for all the imperfection of others. Together, thank you, God, for all the imperfection of others. That I am learning to be perfect in love. Together, that I am learning to be perfect in love. Let's pray. I want you to open your mind, your heart, to a state of love, perfect love, that is bigger than any mistake, any challenge, any problem. And we're going to start by offering that to yourself. That no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter what challenges, no matter what situations, that you allow love to be greater. That you open your heart all the way to love. The love is big and vast. The love surrounds and enfolds our complete human experience. And then we offer that to others. No matter who they are, no matter what they've gone through, no matter what their choices have been, they are helping us perfect love. That we may love one another at the level that God loves us. Thank you, God, for my mistakes. Thank you, God, for my failures. Thank you, God, for my imperfections. And may the power of love be greater in every moment of every day than every situation in my life. And so it is. Amen. This is the time of giving of our gifts and as we move into this time of prayer and meditation, I'm going to ask you to give thanks for everything. And most of us have things that are so easy for us to give thanks for. And we also have a few things that are, are much more challenging. Like, how can I give thanks for that? How can I say thank you, God, for that situation or that condition or that experience? And so we live in this sense of being divided. That some of our life we call good and some of our life we just stay in resistance to. We keep a level of frustration. And as we move into this Thanksgiving week, what if you challenged yourself to give thanks for everything? What if today you decide that for the next seven days, everything is worthy of gratitude? Everything. Even if you don't completely feel it. What if you just open your mind and your heart to every situation, every condition in your life and say, thank you, God. Even if we can only say, thank you, God, for the good that will come from this. Thank you, God, that this situation is not forever. That every time we can look at our life with gratitude and praise, we unleash the greatest level of good. So today, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for everything. 
Thank you, God, for everything that I asked for. And thank you, God, for everything that I didn't. Thank you, God, for everything that I wanted and everything that I didn't want. Thank you, God, for liver and cabbage. Thank you, God, for everything. That today we take a deep breath and we let go of judgment. And we give thanks for everything. We let go of all resistance. And by calling everything good, we allow the good in every situation to be fully present. Thank you, God, for everything. Thank you, God, for all the things that I've been resistant to, for all the things that I've hated, for all the things I wanted to pass on. Today, I open my heart all the way. And I look for God in everything. I look for the goodness of God in every moment, in every situation, in every need, in every desire. I give thanks. I give thanks. And I let go of any situation, any condition that has stood between me and the glory of God. Any perception that has held me back from feeling divinely blessed. That all states of mind, all conditions, all experiences are here to profoundly bless me the ones that I like and the ones that I don't like, the times when I succeed and the times that I fail, that over and over again, we allow life to become so much greater when we stop judging and we just say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for this moment, for this experience, for this day, for my life exactly the way it is. This is a God day. This is a God moment. And today I stay in gratitude. For all the people in my life. For all the people that I love and respect. And I give thanks for the people that I disagree with. Where we see life very different. I suspend all judgment today. And I stand in profound gratitude. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you, God, for my spiritual community. For people that love and support me. Thank you, God, for the spiritual insights that I've been given. And new ideas that changed my life. Thank you, God, for the support, the prayers that my spiritual community offers me. 
I am blessed to be surrounded by these amazing people. Thank you, God, for this day. For all that I have, for all that I am. Thank you, God, for levels of good that often go unnoticed. Today, my prayer is simply thank you, God. Thank you, God, for good and all good. For all of life, for every moment, for the ups and the downs. And thank you, God, that your spirit in me allows me to overcome every situation. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. That in all things we look to God. And in all things we give thanks. And so it is.